Welcome to Professional Conversations. My name is William Cuskin, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome everyone and to also introduce our guest for our first Professional Conversations seminar, Robert E. White. I am very excited to start this off. Um, there's many, many levels here of what we're embarking on. And I'd like to back up a little bit and say that the whole project that this seminar responds to is ultimately the MSEE, the Masters in Electrical Engineering that we have put on the Coursera platform. And this is a global MS in electrical engineering. It's, it's available to the whole world at a lower cost than the residential degree. And Bob Erickson and I, we, with Quentin McAndrew, we came to this idea some years ago. We had just been to the Coursera conference. We found ourselves stranded in Dallas, Texas. And we were thinking about how we were going to get home. We were snowed out of EIA. And we ended up renting a little Jeep and driving home from, from Texas, um, many miles, it was a thousand miles. And we were thinking about the whole advent of massive open online education and really how we could take the disruptive spirit of massive education, the MOOC concept, and utilize it for a degree. So Bob and I talked and we drove through the night. We ate a lot of beef jerky together. And we came to this notion that we would create this open access degree. And in doing that, we realized that, that by utilizing video recordings and making them available online, we'd be cutting down on the human element of education, the human interaction, but we would also be making content available. So as we drove through the night, we began to think about this, and we thought that as we got the degree online, we would begin to expand it by making more interactive, community-based activities possible. And here we are at that. Here we are at really the first of the MSEE's larger interactive opportunities. So I want to thank Erica Reed for, for making this possible, for setting up the website, for getting the technology lined up, and for reaching out across the globe and telling people about what we're doing. I want to thank everyone who's joined us today for being part of really the first, the first experimental conversation about taking the, the, the material we learn, the master's degree level material, and moving into the profession. And I really want to thank Bob Erickson, who's been a mastermind behind the whole program, and now Bob White, who's joined us for our first, our first ever conversation. So Robert White is currently president and chief engineer of Embedded Power Labs here in Colorado. He started his career at Bell Laboratories um, with a, originally a BS from MIT and an MS after that from um, Worcester Polytechnic Institute. He also studied at the University of Colorado Boulder and I've recently learned that he has known Bob Erickson since 1982. We chased him down at a conference. So he is um, a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers and a recipient of the IEEE Millennium Medal. So with no further ado, I want to thank again Bob White for joining us and I want to turn over the session to him. So thank you very much and um, I look forward to your presentation. Okay, let's see. Is everyone seeing my screen? First slide, title slide? Looks good. Yes, sir. We can see that. Okay. 
All right. Well, uh, um, well, thank you, Professor Cuskin, um, for this invitation to give the inaugural talk in the Professional Conversation Symposia. Um, um, don't know quite what I did to be a leader of industry. I just feel like I'm an engineer doing my job. Um, you know, thanks, Professor Erickson, for for nominating me for this. The 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 topic um, uh, I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to focus on uh, things that I think that um, as you go out into industry and develop your career will will lead to uh, success in your career. And so uh, I'll give a little bit about me. Uh, I because this is going to a general audience, I want to talk just, just one moment about what is power electronics. Um, a little bit about success and failure. Um, there's a question of which ladder you're going to take. Uh, are you going to be technical versus management? One question I get from like students in my project lab class is like, when do I know how to change jobs? Right, that's a that's a really important question. I want to take a moment to address that. And then uh, I want to talk about a few factors uh, for advancing uh, your career, um, embracing diversity, your professional visibility, and uh, the need for continuous learning. So the first thing uh, for me um, is um, I, I've been a long time in the industry. Um, I, I had the benefit of a, a really wonderful public school education. Even though I grew up in uh, semi-rural southern Ohio, I had wonderful teachers all the way through that uh, greatly prepared me for uh, for college and enough to get admitted to MIT. But we were a modest family, and there was no money for school for college. So I enlisted in the Air Force. Uh, right, at, this is right at the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, to try and take advantage of some educational programs that, that didn't quite work out, but that was okay. Uh, I'm very proud of my service and honorably discharged. Uh, I went from there to back to MIT, finished my degree, um, went to work for the Digital Equipment Corporation, which at the time was the second largest computer corporation in the world, designing power supplies for their small systems. Stayed with them for a number of years until uh, moving over to AT&T Power Systems Bell Laboratories. Uh, from there, I joined a small company called Zytec, a uh, commercial power supply company, uh, which merged with a competitor to become Artisan, which got acquired by Emerson Electric. Um, and then uh, Emerson closed their design center here in Denver. And I went to work for a small startup called VU1, VU1 uh, developing some really interesting lighting technology. but they crashed and burned pretty quick. They were a fast fail uh, organization. Uh, and so I decided at that time I would try my hand at being an independent consultant. And I founded uh, Embedded Power Labs a little over 10 years ago. And um, I've managed to make my living. Um, what I say is I don't make the money I made when I was a vice president of engineering, but I have a whole lot more fun and I get to take more naps. So. Uh, now, about four years ago, uh, Professor Erickson invited me to create and teach a project lab in power electronics for master's degree students in the professional master's program to give them um, an industrial-like experience as much as possible in the academic setting. And so I'm now in the fourth semester of, of teaching that. Uh, that's been a very, very rewarding thing for me. So along the way in my career, I've, I've held positions from being an individual contributor, an engineer, to all the way up through uh, vice president of engineering. Um, and I've worked in quite a number of areas. I mean, I've been in product design. I've been in groups doing technology development. I've done systems engineering, applications engineering. I've done technical marketing. And then, as I said, for the past 10 years, a consultant uh, working mainly in power electronics um, and mainly working in industrial kinds of power solutions. So that's kind of the, that's that's one aspect of my career, my, my involvement in employment. But there's another very important part of my career that I think is uh, contributed to my success. I'll talk more about this a little bit later. But I've been very active in, uh, for many years, in the IEEE Power Electronics, Electronics Society, uh, I've served on their administrative committee, that's their executive board. Uh, I've served a couple of terms as technical vice president of the society. 
I've been very involved in the IEEE Applied Power Electronics Conference, which is uh, probably the leading power electronics conference uh, in the world. Uh, the latest conference had almost 7,000 people attending, uh, just focused on power electronics. And so I've been doing that for quite a while, and I've had the honor of chairing that conference a couple of times. I've also been involved in a professional association called the Power Sources Manufacturers Association uh, that does uh, quite a bit of work sponsoring research and developing technology and doing power technology roadmaps. And so this volunteer work, uh, this service, is been a very important part of my career, and I will talk about the value of that a little bit later. Some of the stuff you heard there, I've got you know, a bachelor's from MIT, um, a master's degree from WPI. I'm actually a PhD candidate at, at uh, CU Boulder. Um, I'm a late-life, non-traditional, off-campus, self-funded, making glacial progress on a thesis uh, student of Professor Erickson's. And uh, some years ago, I was I, I elevated to IEEE Fellow, a great honor. So I'd like to talk, because uh, my career, my whole career has been in power electronics. I know this is going to a general audience. So what is power electronics? Well, we use electronics in many ways. Most people are familiar with how we use it for information. Now, whether that's you know computing and servers, you know the servers of Facebook and Google and Amazon and Microsoft or whatever, um, you know you, the computer on your on your table, information processing is a key thing we use electronics for. Along with that is communication. Now, whether that's making a, a local phone call or sending a text message or communicating with the pioneer probes out beyond the edge of the solar system, communication is another important thing we do with electronics. And control. Again, whether that's uh, running your coffee maker or uh, running a paper mill, uh, control is a big thing. And then finally, there's energy. We use electronics to process, convert, manage uh, energy for all sorts of things, ranging from your, your cell phone charger to the power system in your cell phone is actually very, very sophisticated at, at uh, preserving, doing every little millijoule to save that battery life, uh, to the power supplies that run those servers at, at Amazon and Google and Facebook, um, to uh, electric vehicles to uh, the enabling uh, highly efficient lighting, LED lighting and, and fluorescent lighting, to uh, the power electronics that enable uh, utility scale solar power and wind power. Uh, so power electronics is a, is a big field and that's uh, power electronics. And so that's been my career. I've spent most of my time working in commercial power supplies for uh, computing and networking and then as a consultant doing projects in industry ranging from designing digital control chips to wireless charges for electric vehicles. So. Now, in your career, as you go forward, um, your career is unlikely to be a nice straight line from here to there. Uh, you will have successes and you will have, you will have setbacks. You will zig and you will zag. You know, I look back on my career, like one of my successes um, was when I was working at Artisan Technology, getting the idea for what became the PM bus, an industry standard way of managing power supplies in systems like servers, um, and uh, which got me elevated to IEEE fellow. And so when you do succeed, when you have a succeed, there are some things that, that you need to do. Be gracious and humble. Okay? and acknowledge others, because no matter how much your own effort, you didn't get there by yourself. Right? There is always somebody supporting you, whether it's your peers giving you a design review, whether it's management funding your project, whether it's a technician helping you build a prototype, there are others. You, did, you um, have done this for, for all of your own contributions. You've done this in an environment with other people. Acknowledge them and, you know, and thank them for, for their assistance. And, and be thankful for your success. Um, you know, I, you know, there's a term out there called attitude of gratitude. And so when you have a success, be thankful for it and enjoy it. But when you fail, and you will fail. I, I've had a number of failures. I've been laid off several times, either because of the failure of the company or the change of business direction, like the, the startup that went under. Um, I was even at one point uh, when I was a director of engineering, 
uh, removed as director of engineering uh, for a number of reasons, but the company said, hey, we, we want to keep you, and they invested in me and um, signed me to a technology development group that led to PMBUS. So there are failures. You know, so you will take two steps forward and you will take a step back. You will zig and you're zag. And when you do fail, you've got to accept those failures. You've got to acknowledge that, yes, I could have done better. Okay, that was, that was a failure. And you have to learn from that and grow from that and turn that into a growth experience. Right? So in my case, after being removed as director of engineering um, and getting some nice professional coaching and feedback, I said I went into a technology group where I was able to make some important contributions to the company and to the industry so you will succeed and you will fail and these are these are a couple of uh, important points to keep in mind along the way okay. well, there we go now the question of which ladder technical or managerial I get asked about this from students most companies will tell you they have an equal ladder. You can, you can climb the technical path or you can climb the management path all the same. It's a lie. Quite simply, it's a lie. The technical ladder tops out long below the managerial ladder. Okay? The technical ladder never leads to the CEO suite. Never. Um, you will have, you know, the managerial suite also has a lot, the managerial path also has a lot more ways into the C suite. You know, the, the, the chief of marketing or sales or operations or finance or whatever. You know, so if you want to reach, if it is your goal to be a top leader in your company or a company, then you'll have to go the managerial path. If, on the other hand, you want to just stay an individual contributor, you can do that, but recognize at some point you'll be a, a principal engineer or, you know, a staff engineer or something, and that's as far as you're going to go. Now, you'll probably come to this crossroad somewhere between three and five years into your career. Um, after you've done a project or two, you may ask, be asked to lead a team. You may be asked to become a supervisor and actually have, um, for example, performance review and salary review responsibilities. So you'll have to think about that. And you'll have to weigh, what, what does success mean to me? What do I want in my career? Um, and what what do I want to do? I I can't I can't answer that. You can only answer that for yourself. Um, there's no one right path. Each path has its has its uh, advantages and disadvantages. It has its blessings and its curses. So, but you will come to that decision probably in three to five years into your career. If you do go from a technical path to the managerial path, make sure you get the training for that. Um, get make sure it's not just an MBA but it's the various people training and the coaching to, to manage people. I also want to say that in either path, you can be a leader. A manager is not necessarily a leader. You can be a leader in any path. So if you have the leadership skills, if you have that, develop that, and you can, you can use that on either path. Okay? So that's a, that's a tough decision to make. Uh, as I said, I've 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 gone. I've I've been a man. I've been director of engineering. I've been VP of engineering. At this point in my t career, I would think very very long and hard before taking a position again as like a director or VP of engineering. Because um, I'm not sure I want that responsibility. I'm having more fun being purely a technical contributor. Another question I get from a lot from students is. When do I know how, when to change jobs, right? Because you're, you're going to leave school, you're going to find a job, you're going to take some position, and so when do you change jobs? Well, sometimes that decision is made for you. I mean, if the company just, you know, does poorly and you're laid off, well, then you're going to change jobs. But if you're in a job and if, with a company and and you're and you're moving along and you're starting to think, well, maybe there's something more. Um, then if you are moving to something better, if you feel like, okay, I've learned all I can here, there's no more challenge, there's no more path up, there's no more, you know, I'm not able to like explore new projects or, or new areas, and you want to move on to new challenges, yes, that's a great reason to change a job. Okay? A bad reason to change a job is because you're unhappy 
You know, um, maybe you're feeling frustrated. Maybe, maybe you're feeling stymied by this lack of opportunity. Maybe the company's doing poorly. But to just say, okay, I'm, I'm, I just, I've had it, and I'm just going to do, get out of here. I'm just going to run away from this situation. That's a poor reason to make a job change at any one time. Make sure that when you do change a job, I mean, yes, maybe you are in a poor situation, but make sure that when you move on, that you're moving to something better, you're, that you're moving to new opportunities, new challenges, new mentors, that you will have an opportunity to learn and grow. And you're not just, um, as, as the American saying goes, that you're not just jumping from the frying pan to the fire. So make sure there's something better, that you're moving towards something better and not just running away. So now I want to talk about a few factors that in my career have been, I think, contributed to, to success, however we each define success for ourselves. And embracing diversity. And yes, we've, we, we get these talks all the time. We get this training on diversity training and everything. And that's all important. But for one of the things for me in diversity is in engaging with, with different people, uh, of of all walks of life, all cultures from all over the world, is that uh, we learn different perspectives. We see how people think about problems, look at problems, look at challenges, how they think about it, how they solve it. And the more that we can learn these different perspectives, the more the more we can bring to solving problems in the future, the more we can offer. I mean, as an example, uh, I was well along into my career when I took the power electronics classes at CU. And at the time, they were taught by Professor Maximovich. And it's like, okay, I've got 30 years experience, and I'm going into power electronics. One, what am I going to learn? You know what? I learned a lot. And it's not so much that it's like, oh, here's the circuit. I mean, I knew these circuits well, right? But Professor Maximovich had a very different way of looking at these circuits, explaining them, thinking about them. And I learned a lot from that. That different perspective, you know, I've added to my own store of outlooks, and it's enabled me to solve problems better. And so the more we embrace diversity, the more we embrace other people and their cultures and their ways of their experiences, their way of thinking, their way of looking at problems, and, and internalize that and make that part of our toolboxes, the better we, the better we can have our own professional success. And so there's a couple of things that for embracing diversity for me. One is you've got to be an active listener. Um, it's hard. It's really, really hard because as soon as somebody starts talking, the first response is like, how am I going to answer that? So you've got to like stop, just stop and listen, you know, listen and, and pay attention and learn and ask questions, actively engage and really try to understand the, this other person and, and absorb that before you before you respond. And I'm I'm not going to say that's easy. It's hard to do. It's even hard to do for me today. Another way that we can get good diversity for me has been traveling all over the world. Um, I've been to Asia many times, for many different countries. I've been all over Europe. I've been to South America. And while interacting with different people on our home turf is one thing, traveling into other cultures, other countries, and being surrounded and working with teams in other countries is, is a great way to, again, see different perspectives, different ways of thinking, different approaches to problems, uh, different tools that are used. Uh, I have found that, that traveling around and working with, with uh, whether it's customers or colleagues uh, around the world has greatly contributed to my ability to perform my job and to succeed. Now, another very important aspect of the success is being visible. Um, you know, I call this professional vi visibility. And a lot of people would say, it's who you know. It's who, you know, I think that's the wrong thing. No. It's who knows you. Why do I say that? Right? It's because if you're in a company and you're working in like an engineering group or something, and then the company's coming up with a new project, uh, it's an important project, means a lot to the company, uh, could, um, you know, whatever for moving the company forward. 
you want your manager's manager to say, hey, I want one or I want Lakshmi on this project because I know they'll do a great job and succeed for the company, right? So it's not that you know your manager's manager. It's that your manager's manager knows you and wants you for that next great project. Or it's your colleagues in the industry. Maybe it's another company that's starting up maybe a, a new project or a new team. And you know they want somebody that can bring 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 their skill and knowledge to that team for success. And so you want colleagues at that other company to say, hey, we need somebody for this position. Hey, go think about Juan or Lakshmi over at the, over at Acme and let's hire them and bring them here. And so that's that's important to move move ahead because you are going to change jobs. You're going to have different projects. And so um, knowing somebody is one thing, but you want other people to know you so that you are picked and chosen to move ahead. One of the ways to get visibility is publishing. So in the academic world, it's publish or perish, right? And I wrote about this, I read a column for the IEEE Power Electronics um, Society magazine, and I talked about professional development and publishing. And um, one of the readers wrote back to me and says, no, for those of us in the industry, it's not, it's not publish or perish. It's publish and prosper. And he was really right. It was David Pace wrote a great book on, um, on multi-harmonic rectifiers and systems. I actually have a copy over there on my bookshelf. Um, he's really right about this, publish and prosper, um, that the more you publish, the more you're known. It's, it goes to that who knows you. Okay? And so publish at every opportunity you get, right? Yes, IEEE journals and transactions look good on, on resumes, um, but for, us, for those of us in the industry, it's not good for the exposure because most people in the industry don't read the journals very much, okay? Critical for an academic career, not looks good on the resume, but it's not going to get you known in the industry. Publishing in things like the IEEE Society magazines and newsletters that get a broader reading, that's an important outlet. Okay? But also trade magazines and now the websites where there's a quite a bit of wide circulation worldwide. That's great exposure. And it's also very easy to get articles accepted to, to these publications. But also, don't forget your own company. If your company's uh, shipping products, if they're writing application notes and white papers, um, especially if the company puts your name on it, as some companies do, that's another great way to publish and get your name out there in the industry as somebody who is an expert or, or knows, knows some particular topic. Along with publishing, writing, presenting, just as I'm doing right now, present at every opportunity. And that's internal to your company. You want, you want to do that. For example, if you go to a conference, you know, take, take notes, come back, give a presentation to your colleagues on what you saw at that conference. You know, who's, what new products? What are competitors doing? You know, what technologies were shown there that, that the company might want to be looking at? So that's a great example on how you can present and get known. If your company does any kind of customer training, focused training sessions, seminars, webinars, uh, again, you know, develop the expertise and deliver those, those kinds of presentations. It's a great way to get known in the industry. Okay? IEEE conferences and workshops are also um, excellent exposure. Um, getting up and presenting at something like the Applied Power Electronics Conference, you're in front of hundreds and hundreds of people, great way to get known. There's also quite a number of uh, commercial conferences. Uh, that can be very good exposure. The, the downside is a lot of those, you, you have to be careful you're not presenting just a pure sales pitch because that doesn't necessarily make you look good. You've got to have a technically substantial con um, presentation conversation with your audience. And locally, there are lots of local IEEE events, uh, chapters and sections. That's a good way to get known, uh, within, get known locally. Okay, and you think you're not a good speaker, stage fright, whatever. You don't have enough confidence to get up there and speak in public. Okay, a lot of people have that problem. So there's an organization called Toastmasters, and it's very effective at coaching people and teaching people and, 
and leading them to develop their public speaking skills so that they can speak effectively in public. Now, one other way to get known uh, in the industry is to participate in online forums. So, for example, LinkedIn has discussion forums. Um, LinkedIn's evolving. It's not quite so discussion focused anymore, but, um, you know, keep a profile, keep it up to date, um, participate. There are quite a number, uh, if you do participate, don't be just a lurker. I mean, because you don't get known. I mean, you've got to give updates. Like a, a person, if you're giving a, a, a paper to conference, you know, put that up on LinkedIn. Hey, I'm going to be speaking at such a, you know, delivering this topic, you know. If you're there, you know, come look me up, say hi. Um, contribute to the group discussions where they exist. Again, you're getting, you're, you want to get your name out there as somebody who's knowledgeable and can contribute. There's also a number of manufacturers of forum, forums, uh, like TI has an A2E, Microchip has a user forum. Uh, these companies have different forums. Uh, that's another way for you to get your name out there. Although, be careful, be discreet. I mean, keep focused on the technical discussion and avoid personal information and opinions, especially in, here in the United States where um, like the political environment is so heated uh, so us versus them. You really want to avoid posting anything like that because you'll just you'll alienate more people than you'll win you'll win over. I also would encourage you, because this is going out to students in electrical engineering, to join the IEEE. Now, there's a lot of criticism of the IEEE to get, that the membership is very expensive and you don't get very much for it. Right. For example, if you join the IEEE, you don't just automatically get access to all IEEE papers. You still have to pay for either society memberships or for a library subscription. And I agree with those, I agree with those criticisms. The IEEE does have um, a lot to do in that area. But the IEEE gives you the chance to participate, whether it's a local section or a local chapter, whether you're working on a society committee, whether you're working on a conference or a workshop committee, working on a standards committee, reviewing papers for journals and conferences. It's the participation, the ability to participate in the IEEE, that is the value. And as you saw, I've been very active in in the society, in IEEE and societies for many, many years. And I will say that I have gotten out many times more than I put in. So it's the, the benefit is not just having the membership um, and getting a, a magazine once a month from your society. It's participating, um, being involved in the societies, contributing, and that also gets you known. That gets, you know, they, that gets your name as you're known as somebody who contributes, works, is knowledgeable. That's, that's another, that's, it's important for you for your professional visibility. It's also important to you because you get so much out of it uh, in return. Now, there are other societies in the IEEE uh, explore those. Um, you know, if you're if you're in electrical engineering, you know, the electrification of transportation, uh, whether that's from uh, small robots to uh, your family sedan to delivery vehicles uh, to electric aircraft. Um, so there are lots of opportunities. But like joining societies like the Society of Automotive Engineers, the SAE, ASHRAE, the Society of Heating and air conditioning kind of engineers, very thermal thermal management, important society, the International Society for Automation, um, and there's more, optics, whatever. There are many professional societies. Get involved. Again, the, the value is not just joining the society and getting the publication. It's getting involved, being on committees, working on committees, and contributing. Uh, you will get far more back than you put in. Now, there's lots of other organizations that you, that you can join. There's charitable organizations and service organizations, your own local government. Uh, for example, my wife volunteered with so, local advisory boards with the county government. Those, those, those bring value to you because they do build connections, but not necessarily pro professional connections that are going to move your career forward. And they do build leadership skills. So those kinds of organizations can, can contribute to your career, but somewhat indirectly. But be very careful. Political and religious organizations may be personally satisfying. You know, they might be rewarding to you in terms of uh, moving your beliefs forward or whatever. But 
keep them out of your professional world. Again, the, the divisiveness of that, you will alienate more people than you win over to you. The other and kind of the last major aspect of, of your professional advancement that I teach the students in my project lab is learn something new every day. Um, that's read the IEEE publications. There's the magazines, the conference paper, the journals. I said those of us in the industry don't read journals, but try and try and keep up with at least one. Okay, but also the trade press uh, in the form of magazines and websites uh, will give you great insight in what's going on in the industry. Yes, a lot of it is just product announcements but you can learn a lot about how the technology is evolving from those announcements. Um, and also there are some really good technical uh, publications in the power electronics world. There's something called Photos Power, um, the How to Power website offer really, really substantial technical content. Okay. And read technology news in general, uh, not just focused on double E. Um, there's a lot going on in the world, I mean, with environment and biology. Um, you you want to be well-versed and know what's going on, not just so focused on electrical engineering, but on, on the world, I mean, the whole technology world in general. And even beyond that, industry and business news. You, you need to know what's going on in the world and how things are evolving uh, so that you can be effective in your job and make good career choices about where where you want to want to work. Like students ask me, like, well, where should I go work? Well, look, you know, one, one thing you would learn is like um, robotics is going to be very important in the future, right? So that might be something you want to consider. But you need to be more than more than just narrowly focused on your on a technical journal in your own field. Consider all technology and consider all of the in industry and business news. So read something every day. Read something every day. And continue your education. I mean, and whether that's formal or informal, whether it's courses on the Coursera or edX, um, do that. I mean, attend the conferences and workshops. Um, go to seminars and webinars, whether it's things like from the IEEE or societies or even commercial and vendor offerings. I mean, these are great. Just you've got to learn, keep learning. I mean, what, what, what we know today, you know, the, the saying is a half-life of engineering knowledge is five years. And so things change rapidly. You've got to keep up. If you don't, in a few years, you will be obsolete. Um, so uh, another is the university distance learning, like this very program, this master, remote master's program. So even if you, have, you finish your master's degree, keep taking courses, you know, to broaden or deepen your knowledge, right? And maybe even consider another master's degree. Uh, for, so, for example, if you're getting a double E, consider a degree in computer science, um, they're depending on your own interest. So, continuing the education, both informally and informally, is, is important. So, to succeed in industry, and kind of heading to our summary here, you can't simply sit at your desk, do a good job, and expect to be recognized. You have to develop your professional visibility within your, comp within your company and within the industry. So. Um, so you've got to promote yourself. You know, you, you've got to publish, you've got to present, um, you've, you've got to promote yourself. But be very careful. Um, don't be a jerk. Don't be a prima donna. You know, as I said, if you if you have a success, you know, acknowledge those that contributed and, and be th and and you know acknowledge them. So, and and when you are talking to management within your company. Emphasize how your work benefited the company. It's not so much, oh, I made this like really cool thing, it was really fun. No, you've got to say, how did it benefit the company? And when you're talking to management, it's all about the money, right? What did I do that is going to improve the financials of the company? Because that's ultimately what the folks in the C-suite care about. So did you uh, cost reduce a product so it's more profitable? Did you... Uh, introduce a new product that will uh, open up new areas of business and bring in bring in new revenue. Well, whatever it is, if you can quantify that uh, in terms of money, that gets management attention. So, in short, though, the best way to succeed 
is to make your boss look good to their boss. So wrapping up here, um, just to kind of summarizing a few of my points. Be gracious and humble in success. Accept and learn from your failures, and you will have failures. As I said, I've, I've had some setbacks, um, but you have to learn and grow for those. In terms of professional vis visibility, keep in mind, it's who knows you. So develop that professional visibility within your company, within your industry, present, publish when you have the chance. And give back, volunteer and serve. So this course that I teach, this Project Lab course that I teach, um, yes, I'm compensated for that. I probably make more money working as a greeter at a big box store. But it is very satisfying to me to have a chance to, to work, with these, work with these students and try and share my experience, my knowledge, my skills, and try and move them along and help better prepare them uh, for, for their entry into industry. And, I, and uh, I, the feedback I get is very, very satisfying. So for me, it's, um, it's a way of uh, way giving back, paying forward, whatever you call it. So volunteer and serve um, you know, in societies and in other ways. And finally, learn something new every day. You've got to keep growing. You've got to keep learning. So I'd say thank you. Thank you, Professor Custon, for the, for the invitation. Uh, I don't know how I did on time, but um, thank you, everybody, for your time and attention. I guess we can now go to questions, if there are some. That was fantastic. Uh, Thank you so much. I, I, I couldn't have imagined a better, more meaningful presentation to start us off. And I, I have a, a sense of a question I want to ask, but I don't want to monopolize. So maybe I'll take the last little bit. Are there other people who have some questions that they'd like to ask at this point that, that Bob's talk triggered? Uh, yes, I have a question. First of all, I really uh, enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, so as a small businessman, how, how do customers find out about you? So uh, how do customers find out about me? Um, quite a bit of it is word of mouth. Um, it's people that I've known, like through my professional societies. Um, I do have a website. I do have a LinkedIn profile. I, I, people search like for Power Electronics Consultant or Power Supply Consultant. Uh, they find me that way. Um, um, th those, those are the principal ways. I have listed myself on some consultant lists here and there. That's honestly not been very productive to me. So between people finding me through, through web searches of my website and LinkedIn profile and just word of mouth, uh, that's that's how I find the majority of my business. Great, thank you. Thank you. There's a great question in the chat. Um, which is more successful? Sticking to one discipline and becoming an expert or, or being skilled in multiple domains and more interdisciplinary? So, okay, so, so the question is, how to be more successful, be a ex deep expert in one area, or uh, be a jack of all trades? Um, that's an interesting question. One of the aspects of power electronics that I really like is that to be successful in power electronics, you have to be both. Uh, power electronics requires um, more than passing knowledge. I mean, some deep knowledge of not just the power circuits, but analog circuits, digital circuits, control theory, uh, thermodynamics and thermal management, uh, electromagnetics, uh, I say controls, um, EMI, product safety. Uh, there's so many aspects, and that's one of the things that appeals to me. Um, either either path. I mean, there are people successful successful in either path. The risk of being a deep expert in one area, though, is you you have to keep up as the technology evolves. Uh, if you become a deep expert and the technology leaves you behind, you're stuck, right? The the danger of being uh, the jack of all trades is you're too shallow 
to make meaningful contributions. And so uh, you can't just be very shallow across a broad area. You're going to have to have some depth of expertise somewhere. But be careful of being so narrow and so specialized that you can't adapt and grow as technology changes. Um, there's another question in the chat. I don't want to give the chat all the uh, air time, but this is a good one. Um, hi, Professor White. I have, a, I have a question. Is it important for engineers in the industry to also get into academics and publishing? Okay, I'm, I'm not seeing the chat. Could you repeat that, please? Is it important for engineers in the industry to also get into academics and publishing? Is it required for engineers in the industry also to get into academics and publishing? Well, it's, um, again, you know, this talk was geared to people going into industry. If you're going to pursue an academic career, I, I can't speak to that. That's, that's, a, that's a different world. Um, if you are in industry, you need to publish, right? But you need to publish where people in the industry are going to see you. That's why I said publish in, in, in the journals um, as, looks really good on the resume. It's, it's good for that, but it doesn't necessarily get you a lot of visibility in the industry that you want. So, um, you know, pub, publish where your colleagues are going to see you. That's the important point. One thing I really appreciated about your talk is that in many ways you emphasize the professional value of humility and the ability, the importance of not just pounding away at every problem, but sometimes stepping back and saying, you know what, I did fail, or you know what, that didn't go the way I wanted it to, and now I'm in a different position. And I guess I wonder about your thoughts. So many students I meet are desperate to get their job. They're desperate to get their degree, their credential, and move ahead for a job. And it's a very problem-solving orientation that I'm sympathetic with because one needs a job in life to move ahead. How, how would you recommend people have a sense of moving ahead, but remain able to take a larger perspective about their immediate circumstances. How do young do students take that larger perspective that allows them to recognize success, the possibility of success from failure? Oh, I don't know. That's a that's a broad and deep question. How do um in your own life, yeah. Did you so, pay to a job and then realize how to move from that to a better position? So you know, what, one of the things that I, that when students ask me, like when they're when they're searching, and, and, and I get, I get, I get these um, requests. Sometimes it's like I've got to make a decision today, Mr. White. How do I how do I decide, right? Um, um, one of the things as, as you as you look for a job and you consider opportunities is um, think about what you're able to learn. In my very my very first job, I when I, I was fortunate when I graduated, it was the, the 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 timing was good, and I had multiple offers and and in different areas um, and. I ended up choosing, as I said, Digital Equipment Corporation. I went to group, and I was surrounded by uh, a team, by, by, by this uh, wonderful set of very experienced engineers. My own manager, supervisor, Dave Bertetti, was, was really a, a great uh, teacher to me, not just technically, but also um, about uh, about conducting myself in business and the value of integrity. Uh, I was surrounded by some really, really great technical people, some of whom I'm still friends with today. Um, and that m early mentorship, I really could not have asked for a better start to my career. And so as you go look for, as you think about that first job, 
one thing is pay attention to the people that you talk with and, and ask yourself, is this somebody I can learn from? Is this somebody I want to learn from? You know, does this company look like it's got, you know, you know, you don't want to be the smartest people. If, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're the wrong, you're in the wrong room. Um, you want to be surrounded by very smart and experienced people from whom you can learn. And so as you think about your first job, as you, as you interview, look for that, look for that characteristic. Um, the other is your first job isn't your last job. Um, the, the days of joining a company and staying there forever are long, long gone. Uh, you know, it's important to, to know you are going to change jobs either within your company or from company to company every few years throughout your career. That is the way life is today. Um, sometimes those choices are voluntary, sometimes they're not. Um, so you want to just be prepared. Uh, as I said, you know, some of my um, talk about don't just focus on technical journals. You know, read about technology in general. Read about the business world in general. Read about the world in general. Keep, you know, try and keep yourself, um, you know, a little broader than just very narrowly focused focused on the latest journal in your area. Um, so that first job, it's it's it is scary, but it's not your last job. Look for the best possible one. Learn what you can, and when you can't learn anymore, move on. I don't know, do, do I answer your question, Professor Cuskin, or not? Great answer. That's a great answer. And I think that there's a through line about perspective. It connects to your, your, your emphasis on diversity, on continuing to learn, and on really thinking about your position, not in a, just a tight little focus, but thinking about it more broadly. I think it's a brilliant point and very well said. It's also important to, to know that success is an individual definition, right? What is success to one is not to another. I mean, what, what is important to you in life? Um, you know, I, I'm fortunate enough, you know, I've had a good enough career. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm comfortable. I live in a nice house and clearly I have plenty of eat and, you know, I'm, you know, that's, that's good enough for me. Right. And, um, you know, but if, uh, I'm, I'm not somebody that wanted to climb to the CEO suite, you know, if that's what you want, then that's your definition of success. Um, if your success is lots of patents, great. If your success is finding a way to contribute to making the world a better place, whether it's, um, renewable energy systems, um, around the world, whether it's developing better solutions or creating fresh drinking water, that's a critical problem in the world today. And it's only gonna get worse with climate change. Uh, if it's finding ways to uh, contribute to the fight against climate change, if, that's, if those are meaningful things for you, then you define success for yourself and pursue the things that you will make you feel successful. And that's a very personal and individual choice. Right. Other questions? Any other questions? Anything on the chat? No. We are wrapping up our time. We don't have questions in the chat. Um, Bob Erickson, did you have a thought? It looked to me like something crossed your mind. Um, well, I was just reflecting on knowing Bob White through the years. And the reason I know him, and as much of a reason as any that he's, you know, I hot, I guess, at one point hired him in the professional master's program was because I knew him from the conferences because Bob did all those things he was talking about in his slides. Um, so, I mean, I remember the conference wrap sessions, which were, uh, Bob was always very active in those and 
in the conferences in general, but uh, the rap sessions were a good one where in the evening at the conference, there would be a keg of beer and an auditorium on a what rap session on some topic and everyone would just talk about it and debate it. <laughs> um, so, you know, going to the professional uh, national or international conference, you get to know people and, and it makes a difference. Certainly doing that made Bob pretty well known. Um, well, that brings us back to the very notion of the professional conversation. Right? Right? Making connections and getting to know people is a way of, of not just passing time, but of broadening who you are and what your shape of your life can be. Um, so let me wrap us up. I think that was a wonderful first talk. Um, I so much appreciate the time and patience you thought you put into it. Um, Bob White is, was, I thought your, your conclusion there about success as an individual definition is something we forget and we tend so often to Success is just measured in money and power. But in fact, there's so many ways of being successful. If we don't articulate those to ourselves, then we can't, we can't assess what we're doing. So on so many levels, I think you really hit the nail on the head. I want to thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Bob. That was a great talk. Great talk. Yeah. This and make it available to the many hundreds of students in the MSEE. And again, thank you. Okay. Onwards. Thank you.